run some of the best workshops I've ever been on. He's also a bit of a cupid. I'll just let him explain that later <laughs> on. Uh, over to you, Mark. Thanks. Brilliant, thank Cheers. you. So Adam came on a workshop um, about 18 months ago, two years ago, and um, it was a presentation skills workshop. And it was a really good workshop actually because we were in Mary Portis' studio and everybody in the studio needed a poo. We had to use downstairs toilets because <laughs> the upstairs toilets were for clients. So I told everyone this. So every time everyone came down, we all sort of had a little giggle and a smile and point our fingers. No, we didn't point our fingers. Poo's a serious thing of which more in a minute. Um, but at the end of it, I'm chatting to Adam and my daughter, Matilda, was there. She was, what she was doing, she was helping out with teas and coffees, I think. And then um, when we left, she said to me, Dad, you know that guy you were talking to? I said, yeah, Adam. She, he was really rude. There was, this woman kept trying to talk to him and gave him a, a business card and he, and he ignored her. Yeah, that was Pip. And they're now a couple. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, it, <laughs> and it took a week for it to sink in. Um, so hello, my name's Mark and um, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to use the medium of 1970s and 80s pop music to explain my journey through, through the gut. And, um, and, and I'm old, I'm, I'm 50, I was born in 1968, so I've got a lot of material to get through in that time. Um, <laughs> and I, I like to start with a sing song, actually. Every talk, I like to start with a sing song, so I'm looking for a volunteer. Big voiced diva. Or not. Anybody? No? <laughs> But because I'm so old, this is, la this is really laggy, isn't it, actually? Because I'm so old, like, that's getting, that's getting quite long in the tooth, yeah? My cultural references are now drifting into the dim and distant past, and all the kids go, what the fuck are you talking about? So I thought I'd bring it right up to date. And it's kind of worse. It's like music for old people. It, it, it's, it's true. So I know she's really talented. Oh man, this is going to drive me insane. I know she's really talented, but like my mum is 72 and she likes Adele. And my youngest daughter's 15 and my oldest daughter's 24. Um, and they like Adele. Now, I didn't like, ever like the same music as my grandparents. That was, would have just been absolutely wrong. But there's this, there's this link now, which is really interesting. Um, and, and I've been involved in kind of gut health as a, as a kind of guinea pig, really, for a long time. So when I was... Well, I, I bought the book Gut by Juliana, Julia Enders. Have you, any of you read that book? It was on your slide, actually. So it's a, it's, it's a really great introduction. She's a German physician, really young, really funky. And it kind of it changed the way I ate, and it changed the way I, I shat as well. I pooed. Because... <laughs> Because we kind of, I'm going to take my jacket off because I'm feeling slightly energetic. Because um, when we poo, like, we poo pretty much at right angles. We poo like this. I have to lean backwards. <laughs> we poo like this, right? And so, like, we've got to, it's like having a baby. You, you, you really don't want to do it laying down because you've got to kind of work against nature. And what, how we should poo is we should poo like this which straightens out the kink in our bowels, okay? Everything flows through. Well, try it. Go into the garden. <laughs> <laughs> or put a bag down. Have a shit. Have a shit on the crouch. It changes everything. And, and it's only the Western population that have problems with hemorrhoids, that have problems with anal fissures, anal fistulas. Trust me, I've got all of these things. <laughs> Dreadful. And a number of those camera things as well, although... I would never have said my doctor. What did you call your doctor? Well, my doctor was me and Fit. Fit, yeah. He had a camera up the thing and he was like, oh, do you live in Kentish Town? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you're not having, he's got your address, hasn't he? He's got your address on your card, yeah. Um, so I had all those things and, and, and it changed the way I put, you can buy something called a squatty potty. Seen those things? It lifts your, it lifts your legs up a little bit higher. So I read this book and thought, oh yeah, so... So, of course, I now understand the gut. But what I didn't think about was I'd already had a little dabble in gut health. So when I was 30, 20 years ago, I had this... Um, I'm not going to call it a midlife crisis because that kind of makes it sound bigger than it was. But I had this kind of like mortality rush where I was being bullied at work. I was being, being bullied at um, a public sector job I was doing. And, um, and I kind of took to my bed in some kind of 
anxiety driven thing. And, I, and then I got morbidity. I thought I was going to die. I thought I'd got CJD. I didn't. I'm all right. Um, although I did eat a lot of shit beef, more of which in a minute. Um, and, and I didn't know what was wrong. And I couldn't, I had fizzy fingers and, and, and my head was bad. And I had like anxiety. And I went to see an incredible woman who was a bit of a witch, lives in, in Norfolk now, but lived in Bingley at the time. And, um, and she kind of sorted me out a little bit. And she said to me, Go and, go and buy, go to this garage, and when I say garage, I don't mean like a shell garage, I mean like a, sort of the back of someone's house. Go to this garage in Haworth, knock on the door between four and five on a Tuesday, and ask for a bottle of kombucha. Now, as far as I knew, kombucha was like a new form of poppers or a new form of um, LSD, <laughs> more of which in a minute. And, um, <laughs> and, and so I knock on the door and this kind of grubby bloke comes out and he says, do you want some kombucha? So th this is, I'm thinking, this is definitely a drugs deal. And it's like £3.50. I wasn't, I wasn't paying that for dope at the time. So I, I, I handed over my £3.50 and I took this bottle, which... If I say it was lively, it would be an understatement. It was, when my granddad died, he left us a load of ginger beer brewing in his shed. We had to hold them with sticks because they were just going off. And, and I, had the, I had the same thing, this, this, ginger, this, um, this kombucha. But I took it home and I tried it and it tasted a bit vinegary, but it was 20 years ago, we hadn't really worked, he hadn't really worked out how to do the whole kind of acidity thing. And I got better. And I got better because I was seeing this magic witchy woman. And I got better because, because I, I was wanting to get better. And I got better because I was changing my gut flora. And we, and we know now, it's really clear, the link between healthy and diverse gut flora and depression, or sorry, a non-healthy and a non-diverse gut flora and depression, they're not just strong, it's proven. The links between poor gut flora and suicide is, is proven. We are what we eat. We are what we eat eats as well. And all of these things go into our guts. And we now take 95% of all of our calories. All of our calories come from 30 crops. That's really poor. Diversity wins when it comes to anything to do with the gut. So what I wanted to do, that's what I do, you don't need to read that. Um, I wanted to talk you through my, my kind of career on this slide but also growing up and the sort of food that I ate. And you're, you're a nice audience because you've got some really youngsters in here and you've got some people who are a bit younger than me, but around about my age, I'm guessing. So some of these things might, might be useful, but I've, I've summarized my entire career onto one slide. And like you, there is a moment of mum clarity and dad clarity on this, and it's here. They had no idea about any of this, maybe a little bit about this and they've got no idea what I've done some, since. But when I was head of sustainability at ASDA, that, that, that was the dinner party conversation. Oh, Mark, yes, head of sustainability at ASDA. <laughs> Lives in Leeds, it's not so bad, even though it's quite far north. Um, and um, yeah, you do, yeah, carry bags and things, yeah. So, so the, that, that was the moment of clarity, okay? This, fucking no idea, right? And, and I'm glad. This, fucking no idea, right, so. That's where we are. Um, so I started off being quite rebellious quite early. Um, I went to school in the 70s and the 70s were famous, as we're going to see in a minute, for two things in the UK. Strikes, like with three day week, everyone was on fucking strike. And shit food. Re am I okay swearing? It's a bit late, isn't it? But am I okay? I'm yes. gonna, yeah, okay. Um, and shit food. And I thought I'd try and unify these two things. So at school in, 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 in Leicestershire, in the 1970s, I thought what we, what we really needed, instead of the healthy overboiled cabbage, but we did have vitamins and minerals in our dinners. We had proper cooked dinners. I was at home eating shit food. I was eating something called Primula cheese spread, right? <laughs> Just imagine this, the, 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 the milk, that's used to feed baby calves, thickened and then added with prawns and squeezed into a tube, right? But what, what made it nice was you got a little star on the cap to pierce the foil. So when you did your little, your little prawn thingies, it, it, it was all ziggy zaggy edgy like a ziggy zaggy edge tomato and some of you are like i've not had a ziggy zaggy edge tomato for a long time you're there aren't you i can see it whereas some of you are thinking what the fuck is a ziggy zaggy edge tomato right google it it's amazing it changes the whole taste of the tomato 
And, and, and I wanted to bring those two things to school and I didn't want vitamins, I wanted shit food at school. So, so I took the school out on strike. I had 120 kids marching up and down the playground. There was only 121 and Neil Smith was never going to join me, ever. <laughs> um, I had 121 kids in the school and they... And, and we marched up and down, we had placards, and we were, we were shouting down with dinners, we want sandwiches. And after three hours, this is pretty hardcore, and we won. Like management teachers gave in, right? They said, okay, you can bring sandwiches. So I went home that night and told my mum not quite the truth. I said to mum, mum has been this thing at school, and as a result, we're allowed to bring sandwiches instead of dinners. And my mum rightly said, well, Mark, some people will be allowed to bring sandwiches. Me and your dad both work, and sometimes you have sandwiches for your tea, so you're having a hot dinner every day, and it's going to be at school. Uh-oh. Embarrassment. So day one of the new regime, I've got my tray, and I've got all my mates giving me the international sign language for idiots. I'm not going to do it, but you know the one. And I'm stood there, Mrs. Thomas, the only nice dinner lady that ever lived, right in front of me. She's looking at me, and I'm looking at her. I liked her. All the others were absolutely horrible to me, but I really like Mrs. Thomas. And she said, do you know what, Mark? I'm glad you're still with us. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Thomas. And she knew it was me. Well, the whole village knew it was me. She said, do you know what would happen, Mark, if everybody had, had sandwiches? And then Mrs. Thomas? She said, I wouldn't have a job, Mark. Richard, her son, Richard wouldn't have a Christmas present. I, I didn't give a shit about Richard. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I really like Mrs. Thomas. And, and it was that moment of, uh, that I realised with great power, great power, with great power comes great responsibility. And, and our responsibility is also to ourselves as well as to the dinner ladies of Sharnford Church of England School. Um, so that's when I started being difficult. I was, also, I was nearly expelled in sixth form for having an a cappella heavy metal band, um, which was main, it wasn't about the music, it was actually about the naked, nakedness that we, we like to perform. <laughs> Naked. And then um, in the 80s, remember the 1980s, some of you, it's just a playlist on your iPhones. <laughs> for the rest of us, it was a real place with music and everything. I was nearly sacked from Tesco's for, um, um, for refusing to move apples from South Africa because of something called apartheid, which we were all, none of us were eating South African apples. So why the fuck would I move them? And the bloke said to me, you're not moving them. I said, I'm not moving them. There's this thing called apartheid and it's dreadful. And if you say it out loud, you'll feel sick. And he said, so you're on strike. And I thought, oh fuck, twice. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. So I said, yeah, I'm on strike. And 30 people, quite a long way behind me, 30 people said, we're on strike too. We're with Mark. Technically you're not, you're a long way behind me. And we, and we went on strike. And, and, and to be fair to Tesco's, they're amazing. So don't worry, we understand. Um, We'll find people with no morals to move the apples, <laughs> loads to choose from. And, um, and I got dispatched to work in the freezer for three days, and that is the truth. But if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. And then I, worked, I was head of sustainability at Asda, mum and dad clarity, and I do some eco design stuff. My friend David started the do lectures, and I came in to help wrote a book, and now I help big companies think small and, and vice versa. And I make a sauce brand, I make a, a sauce called Hot Smoky Bastard, which is hot and smoky, it's mainly smoky, more than hot. Um, uh, and I just do that in the kitchen on my own, and it's a while away the weekends, because I've got nothing else to do. And, um, and I sell it online every now and again, and it's, I love it. And it's a dreadful business. It's really expensive sauce as well, still makes no money. But I'll, I'll sort that out next year. <laughs> So I've grown up in disruptive times and, I, and, I, and I'm trying to use this, I, I just love music and, and I particularly love my childhood so I'm going to relive it because why not, I've tried to do that through my children and they're not happy about it so I thought I'd do it straight away again. But my daughter's pregnant so I'm going to be doing it again for my grandchild from May. Ready for that, I wasn't. Anyway, um, so I was born in 1968. <laughs> the thing is about that, right, the, my, my immediate reaction was it's okay, it's going to be fine. <laughs> And she leaves the room and I go, for fuck's sake, it's not good timing for me. <laughs> Guess what, Shayla? It's not about you. It's the best news ever. So I grew up at 1968, height of the social rights movement. Gil Scott Heron was at his peak. Um, hippies um, were everywhere, fucking falling over them, just walking down the street. Um, and we had this kind of social revolution. 
And we had second wave feminism um, in the early 70s. I dressed up like this the vast majority of the time. It was the nightmare going for a poo, actually. It, just, it took a long time to get out of that. Um, and I love glam rock. I don't mean Gary Glitter, obviously. We all knew. No, we didn't. Um, I, I, meant, I meant Mark Bolan. I just love T-Rex. Love T-Rex. Um, and then we had the strikes in the 70s. Uh, and I lived on a diet of sugar. Because I had two nans, like most of us. I had one nan that, that spent time with me and had no money. And I had one nan that was quite rich and ran a sweet shop. And I loved them both equally for different reasons. But the one that had no time and lots of money, she used to buy me shit. But remember, to me, you've got no idea what I'm talking about. Golden nugget chewing gum. Amazing. <laughs> like, amazing. And the little bag, it's fucking awesome. Uh, Tizer or Urn Brew, if you're north of the border. Just sugar and colour. Look at the colour of that. And then Golden Nugget Nabisco, Nestle now, um, Golden Nugget cereals. What colour was the milk when you finished eating these? Can any of you that are my age remember? Green. Green? <laughs> Yellowy green. I didn't know how it did it. I still don't know how it did it. But I, I, I lived on this stuff. I absolutely lived on this stuff. <laughs> And I love Bowie. I love Bowie because I love dressing up. And I love crispy pancakes. And I love Angel Delight. And this isn't going to click on. And I love Dantic Roll. And I love punk. We all love punk, don't we? Why am I showing you punk? I'll tell you in a minute. But like most things, it only got better when women got involved. And it became melodic. And Susie arrived on the scene, and that's beautiful, still rebellious. And punk was the soundtrack to the late 70s for me, and I super loved it, because it was angry, because it was rebellious, and, and it fought what came before, what came before punk, for those of you who are the same broad category as me in age. What was the musical movement before punk? No, no, but you're close because when mods, had, mods have had three bites of the cherry now, 60s, late 70s on the back of what I'm going to show you next, actually on the back of Scar, um, it was prog rock. Th 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 these things are contradictions in terms. You can't have prog rock. Prog rock was like a 30 minute guitar solo. You could go to a band, Hawkwind say, and you could pay your money and you'd go in and the first song would start and the guitar solo would start. You could get a stamp on your hand, go out, have a pint over the road, go to the toilet, come back in and the guitar solo would still be going on. 30 minutes. So punk was about the anger and the aggression of the street and the short, fiery, short, fiery creativity. Really interesting. And it was paired with a denaturing of food. This next advert is one of my all time favorite adverts. Remember the, the curly whirly, you can still get them. This is what it looked like back then. Oh, then how much is that box? It's about here, it's only worth 10,000 pounds. Ha ha, this curly whirly with all its miles of chewy tubby, covered in creamy cabbage, chocolate, it's 10 minutes old, very cost free, Pete. Of course, you can't stick flies in it. Ha ha ha, but you can't chew a vase. Ha ha ha, that's funny. And I used to have maybe four or five chocolate bars a day. So, my gut flora was really bad, and then I was feeding it sugar. So the really bad stuff was growing really, really fast. And I grew up with poor gut flora. And we denatured food. On your last trip, did you discover what the Earth people eat? They eat a great many of these. They fill them with their little knives. Boil them for 20 of their minutes. Because that's way better, isn't it? <laughs> like the closer we get to where our food comes from, and the more, and if we got mud on your fingers, you know you're headed in the right direction. To totally. And you know this because that's why you're here. Yeah. Um, it, what, what was I listening to? Obviously, punk had turned into ska because diversity matters. Diversity matters, not just in musical terms, which we're going to hear in a minute, but it matters in our bellies as well, and it matters in where our calorie comes from, and it matters in the colours on our plate. 
Diversity makes us stronger. The most successful businesses on the planet are the most diverse. The best gut flora on the planet comes from the most diverse food. Diversity really matters. And in music, I lived in Coventry at the time, um, we had an amazing time because we had a whole load of people come over from um, the West Indies to work in the car factories. And they didn't just bring their hands and they didn't just bring their brains, they bought their, their, they bought their musical instruments. And we had this incredible movement called two-tone, which sounded like this. And suddenly you've got this really creative nexus happening in Coventry, of all bloody places. How did that happen? This is really, really laggy, sorry. Um, so, where were we next? So, um, Scar, pretty paired back, and uh, Punk, pretty paired back. What's the reaction to that? The flamboyance of the New Romantics. Started in Covent Garden, the Blitz Club. But what were we eating? We were still denaturing things. This advert is so bad for so many reasons. <laughs> I'm gonna play it, but please do not, ju do not judge me. Oh, that's ice cream! I can milk it, rise and shine. What's your call, Johnny? It's time for my taste buds tingling already. It's not orange juice, it's rise and shine. You simply mix it with water. Oh, that lovely vitamin C. Not that you look at it, you come in Sorry. In my country, we say skull. Rise and shine from Kellogg's. So dried instant orange drink. I mean, honestly, what the fuck were we thinking? <laughs> Oranges were quite hard to get hold of still. We were still on a post-war economic footing, weirdly, at this point. But this was, it wasn't just dreadful, it was a treat. This was weekends for me. We'd taken nature away from the foods that we drank because we were in this kind of scientific expansion. But musically, things were getting interesting because musically, we had the new romantics. And we had the, the, the drop on this song, you can't really call it a drop, but you're gonna hear the siren call in a minute and you're gonna love it. That, oh, I've got goosebumps now. I wanna go dancing. But like everything brilliant, it goes to be dreadful because we overdo it. And the romanticism ended up looking like this. I mean, honestly, enough of that shite. And I know Duran Duran's first album was really good, but I know everything else was absolutely horrific. So, so what happened next? Well, we had yuppies, we had the Cold War. Mark went to university nearly. I was on the edge of uni. I started drinking in Hinkley. Um, Smiths were around, a bit of Bowie, obviously. I was drinking Marston's Pedigree. Marston's Pedigree is good for sleep, bit of hops, really good for sleep, but actually not helping my belly because we denatured a bit of brewing. This wasn't craft beer, this was mass-produced beer. I wasn't eating craft bread. I wasn't making, I'm middle class, I make sourdough on a Saturday and I squeeze myself into Lycra and ride my bike on a Sunday. That's what I do, I'm middle class. I'm 50 and middle class, that's what I do. But back then, I was eating as much white bread as I could get my hands on. And when you take the middle out of a piece of white bread from Mother's Pride, for example, or Warburton's, and squeeze it into a ball, it doesn't spring back, does it? Turn this thing into something dreadful. White bread itself is absolutely pure, simple carbohydrate. It's really bad. To have too much of it, it's nice to have the odd cheeky slice when you're on holiday, but you don't want to be basing your diet on it. And we did that because after the war, to pay the Americans back for saving us, we agreed to buy wheat off them. We agreed to buy their wheat off them, and their wheat had been bred to be really high in gluten, so it rose faster, and to be really low in everything else. Because if, if you had wheat germ in bread, if you had any of the fiber, it went off faster. So we denatured it so it lasted longer, rather than buying more regularly. So we, we just took nature away from the food, and we took it out of here. And this is super bad. Coke pissed around with a new flavor, didn't go down very well, but the mighty Smiths were here. This guitar intro, genius. Isn't that? Goosebumps again, amazing. Sorry, it's really laggy, can't do that. But at the same time, we had this. You know where this is going, don't you? 
Now some of you are so young that in an ironic way you like this. But you don't know how much we hate, you love it don't you Pip? We hated it, right? This was shit, but not quite as shit as this. It should play-ish. And you know it's shit, don't you? But at the wedding, oh yes. Because we denatured pop. Like that's not natural. I, lo I, love, I love a long hair. I, I played around with a bit of long hair myself. Play around with gender roles, all of those things are great. That's shit, right? <laughs> You can disagree with me. So where were we? So um, well, the internet began to emerge at this point. I was at university. I was drinking Newcastle Brown, but I was also drinking Lucozaid. Whoa, this is interesting. Suddenly in clubs, Lucozaid started out selling beer. Hmm, wonder why that was. Do you know? When you're on an E, when you're mad for it and you're absolutely spilling off your tits, <laughs> you don't want to drink beer. But you're up all night, so you need something to feed that love. <laughs> Trust me, love was a thing. So you want the sugar. So this drink, which is here, you might hear a song in a minute, I can't remember when it starts. This drink you used to give to people who were dying. Like you knew, if you were in hospital and someone bought you a bottle of Lucozade, you were fucked. <laughs> like, yeah, like, you knew it was the end. Because you got Luke's thing. It was like the canary in the coal mine. Actually, ecologically, this is a brilliant piece of packaging. It's glass, refillable, returnable. This is we would call we call this cellophane. And to right now, today, we think of cellophane as something that's made of oil and plastic. Cellophane is made from wood, it comes it comes from cellulose. That that's what it's from. And it's beautiful. And and during the house era, I'm gonna play some Chicago House in a second. I'll play it now. It takes a little while to get into it. Um, during the house era, this became the drink of choice for the raver. So this changed what we were drinking. It, it changed our gut biology. All that sugar, all those chemicals, not from the drink. I just love this song. There's a big part of me that's just so camp, it's untrue. Um, and Lucozade went bonkers when this happened and they tried to pull away from the club culture. Nah, they needed to embrace it, which they finally, finally did. I'll just wait for it to start really kicking in, then I'll pause. Should be about now-ish. Maybe a bit longer, I can't remember. I won't bother. Um, and so, so what we drank and what we ate changed. And then the four best men on the planet arrived. Stone Roses, my favourite band. You can disagree with me. You'll be wrong, but you can disagree with me. And I was maturing and getting older, but what I really wanted to be, obviously at this time, as a white man from Middle England, I wanted to be a black rapper from New York. <laughs> Clearly, I wanted to be in Public Enemy. I don't know what this word This, this. Brilliant. Yes. Anyway, enough of that. Um, what was I drinking? You were all asking. What was Mark drinking? Wow. We saw the beginning of the wellness era. And we saw you're either all in or you're all out. You either give a shit about your body or you drive it harder. <laughs> This is not that great actually. Packaging wise, it's horrific. It's a glass bottle wrapped in plastic. It goes into the recycler. No one knows what to do with it. It fucks up every single bit of glass recycling on the planet. No, it's, it's horrific. They just need to sort it out. We all think it's great because it's glass. Trust me, it's dreadful. You give a shit about the fish? You worried about the plastic in the ocean? So you should be. Plastic has no place in the ocean. Climate change is our single biggest challenge we face right now. If you give a shit about fish, stop eating them. Really simple. It's really simple. Biggest threat to the ocean? Overfishing. Second biggest threat to the ocean? Climate change. Fifth biggest threat to the ocean? Plastic. It's way down the list. It's important, but other things are more important. What about this? You're all looking at Jolt Cola, all the sugar, twice the caffeine, and you're all thinking, hmm, <laughs> you get a case of those. Well, if you wanted a case of those, you couldn't buy it from a shop. You had to buy this from the back of a computer programming magazine. Genuinely, you couldn't buy it from a shop. 
You had to be a coder, oh yeah. <laughs> Three hours sleep, poof, we're wimps. This was a really interesting culture. We propped ourselves up on caffeine, whether it be coffee, start of the latte world as well. <laughs> and then we propped ourselves up on this. And both of these things are interesting, but both of them relatively poor drinks. The gut floor are relatively poor drinks. But it's okay because Damon and Co appeared to save us. <laughs> that, that is a lovely intro, isn't it? It's a beautiful intro. Graham Coxon was a genius, is a genius. Right, and I had kids at about this point, right? And, and I, I was friends with Blur for a little period, didn't last long, I had kids and I was uncool. So everything I bought <laughs> changed, right? Because I wanted my kids to have great gut flora. Mistakenly, I fed them with sugar masquerading as fruit. We know this is not so great now. But I was all about the tasty vegetable risotto from Hip Organic. I wasn't going to let my kids eat crispy pancakes, get mad cow disease from all the shit that I ate. So I was going to give them great tasty vegetable risotto. Because I'm middle class and I ride my bike and make sourdough and all those things. But what didn't grow up that way. Musically, oh, we ended up having something called New Rave. Some of you will like this. Sorry, it's shite. No, it's not, it's very good. Um, so that was really interesting. But, where, but, but what happened after that? Well, my kids are now 24 down to 14, and we've seen loads of changes. The internet, the democratization of creativity. We've seen the spreading of messages like yours into the palm of our hands, into our black mirror. This is brilliant. If I wanted to find out about veganism in 1972, I'd have to go and find a vegan. And trust me, there weren't many. In 19, not like now, you fucking fall over them. <laughs> I, I'm one-ish, unless I've killed it myself. And, um, and, and this has changed everything. The democratization of retail. We can buy anything we want and have it delivered tomorrow. I'm trying a load of new tropics at the moment for brain. I've done a really interesting project on brain health. Links to gut health, obviously, but also working on a whole load of other things. A load of other stuff's changed, stuff that you can read about there. Uh, musically, I mean, I'll play that in a second, but I I'm mainly eating tofu at the moment. Kimchi, I'm stuck, we make kombucha, we make... We is this one still recording? Good. We make, um, we make coconut water kefir. So the pre and probiotics are built into my, into my diet and I also take them as well. I don't know whether they're helping or not. I'm still fat, but I'm feeling quite strong with my fatness. Um, and, and I take a spoonful of inulin in my tea at night. Now it used to be a bottle of Newcastle Brown before bed. Now it's a little cup of snooze from tea pigs because they're lovely, cuddly people who make tea. And um, a teaspoonful of inulin, inulin is, a, is a prebiotic, it's ground chicory root, it, 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 what's the word, it encourages good gut flora, you know more about this than me. Most importantly, when you, look, when you watch Michael Mosley, the, the truth about sleep, a teaspoonful of that in his sleep every night gave him about 45 minutes extra sleep. Really interesting. I swear by it. Now, of course, it's become psychosomatic. Sleep really well with it. If I forget it, I begin to worry that I've not had my inulin, and that worry is enough to make me wake up in the middle of the night going, fucking hell, I didn't have my inulin. <laughs> or it's too late, Shayla. It's three o'clock in the morning, you've got a 16-year-old dog down and says, if you're first down, you'll be clearing up shit. <laughs> Never be first down with a 16-year-old dog, I can assure you. Um, uh, and, I'm all, and, I'm, and I'm all about the kale. I'm all about the kale. Did I tell you earlier I've been taking this broccoli supplement? Did I mention that? Really interesting, there's a little ingredient in broccoli that's like super, super good for brain health. And I can't remember it, but it's on my phone, but I'm not going to be, I'm already running over. I don't, t time has no relevance in my world. And um, this stuff's incredible for brain health, keeping you active, keeping you fiery, for, for in, in, enhancing your agility. Great. So I've been taking this supplement every day. Mistake number one, don't take it before you go to sleep, which is what I was doing. With my vitamins and my inulin, and my prebiotics, taking it, waking up at three in the morning, like, fucking hell. God, the best idea ever. The combination of theta brainwaves and this little bad boy, or girl, and suddenly I'm firing on all cylinders. I moved it to the morning, it helped. I'm now playing around with something called Bacopa Manieri. 
can't remember how you pronounce it, but it's on my little magic phone, which is in there. I can tell you later some really good stuff. And of course, I don't drink anymore. I drink fucking Seed Lip, don't I? You wonder what Seed Lip is? Alcohol free spirit substitute. Really interesting business because my world's changed. And you mentioned it earlier. I go and see my, my, well, my daughter before she was pregnant. I go and see her. And she lived in um, oh, a bit of posh North London near Muswell Hill, East Finchley. And, um, and I go and see her and stay the night. And I said, Should we go for a pint? Because that's what I did when I was at university. And she says, Well, we could, Dad. We could do that. We could go for a pint and you would pay £8 a pint each. He's eventually. Um, and there's four of us, so you would be paying, and the other is all me, you would be paying £32 and we'd all, and that's only if we have one, and we'd all come home and we'd all be slightly less healthy than when we set off. Or we could stay here, have a kale smoothie and do some yoga. <laughs> <laughs> She's right, but there's a bit of fun missing there, isn't there? <laughs> So this is, this is where I've ended. And, and, and actually, it's really important because wealth with shifting, unless you're, unless you're really struggling for money and a massive proportion of the population is, I'm middle class, wealth is less important than health. It just is. My barometer's shifted. I don't want to do as much living as I can. I want to do as long a living as I can. And I want that living to be really healthy. I don't want to be pe- I watch my parents and I love them dearly, but they drink like fish. I watch my mother-in-law and their boyfriend and I love them dearly-ish, and they drink like fish. They drink so much. I, don't, I want to wake up feeling bang. I'm awake. I'm a, I want to go running. I want to embrace the world. I've got a fucking grandkid to look after soon. And I, and, I, and I want to do that. So, so purpose is back, and, it, and, it, and for me, it's back because I want to live better, not, not, and I want to live longer. Both of those things. Musically, Run the Jewels. You all listen to Run the Jewels, don't you? Yeah, one or two of you. Atlanta's finest rap duo. <laughs> Singing about stuff, rapping about stuff that matters. Like when rap was young and they rapped about equality rather than cruising around your hood. That's what these guys do. It's brilliant. And I turned the telly on the other week, month, and I saw this and it filled me with joy. I'll have to click twice because it's... And in, and in this time of like absolute political chaos, in, in the time where I haven't got a place for my vote, I haven't, I don't know where to put my vote. It only used to go to one place or the greener variety of the same place. I can't put it there anymore because there's no leadership, none. In this time, I have never felt angrier and I've never felt more political and I'm not alone. I'm surrounded with people that want to do something and they don't know what to do and we trust companies more than we trust politicians. That's proven. That's statistically and analysed every year. So what do we do? You've got to look after you. Your responsibility is to you to make yourself the strongest, healthiest person you can be. Because the times are gonna be tough. Brexit is a shit show waiting to happen. I don't think it'll happen. However, suddenly we're in a world where good is the new cool. It is, it just is. Health is the new wealth, well is the new thin. I don't care that I'm overweight, I just wanna be fucking strong. I've got a revolution to lead. Got another strike to probably pull off next week. Um, <laughs> kindness is a competitive advantage. I, 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 the days of The Apprentice, you're fired, you muffin, they're, they're gone. The people running businesses now, they're the punks. They've just got older. They're the goths. They've just got slightly less dark. They're the, they're the scar, the leaders of scar. They're just doing creative stuff in other ways. The old guard are dying, and that's a good thing. I don't mean dying literally, but they're moving up. The, the generation that are retiring now, the baby boomers, my friend says they're the generation that took and took and took and never gave anything back. There's some truth in that. 
They had all the peace, they had all the money, they all had all the house price improvement, they had all of the social care, and they've had all of the pensions. We're different, it's gonna to be tough. So we need to look after ourselves, and looking after yourself starts with what you eat. The moment that something that you put in your mouth, the moment that the taste of it is less important than what it does to your body, you're all in. When the taste is more important than what it does to your body, you're all out. And everyone is moving in. Living longer, living better is, is, is where it's at. And it starts here. And it starts with the companies that you support. I work with some of the world's largest companies. Now, people at Patagonia don't need me. They're already pretty good. So I have to work with people that aren't always good. And it's okay because they are changing faster than you will ever know. Above, they're like a swan above the water. It's all the same. We're selling the same old shit to the same old people. Under the water, everything's changed. They're paddling like fuck. They're all trying to get up to health. They're all, every one of them is moving. And they understand that the belief systems of their customers are different from what they used to be. So I'm really positive about where things are going. We've just got to be a bit more patient about it. The world is changing super fast. I'll be really, really quick about this one. All these power shifts are happening. West to east, male to female, old to young, old thinking to young thinking, retail to consumer, professional to amateur, physical to digital, truth to alternative facts, product to service, CSR, CSR's dead. It's just pointless. We're a really bad company, but it's okay. We support 10 schools over there. We're horrific in what we do, but it's okay because we've got this little program over here where we're saving orangutans. Because we all love an orangutan, don't we? Just don't eat them, right? Um, CSV, creating shared value, this is where it's at. Spending every single penny well that your business owns. Don't do harm with your money and you don't have to have a CSR policy, there you go. It's really simple. If we just do that, Nestle, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, they're all moving in this way. Trust me, they are. You might not see it. And then from wealth to health. From owning stuff to living longer. How many of you want more stuff in your house? Anyone got, not got enough possessions yet? <laughs> Look at the explosion in the yellow box world. It's fucking dreadful. Yeah. You all saw the news last week about the calorie count of sit-down meals. Shock horror. Sit-down meals have more calories than takeaway meals. Yeah, because the plate's bigger than a box. Eating out is no better than taking out. Start every... It's hard. We're all busy people. Start every meal with a knife and a glug of olive oil. Can't go wrong. Just cook from, from scratch. Make sure that all the vegetables on your plate are different colors. Make sure that there's more vegetables than anything else on the plate. It's really simple, said the fat guy at the front. But it is really simple. Eat better, not, not to be thinner. Oh, I'll shut this up because you don't want to, do, you don't want to hear any of that. Fleas, anyone interested in fleas? Yeah, do you want to hear a story about fleas? Be really quick. So our constraining beliefs, the things that hold us back, they're not always real. So you might think that you can't change your diet, you might think that you can't change your business, you might think that you can't change where your money goes or where your pension goes, you can. And I'm gonna demonstrate this by talking about fleas. So when you train fleas, fleas are pretty powerful numbers. It's beautiful, this flea. I don't know what this bit is. Um, pretty powerful legs, right? A flea can jump from the floor to above my head, yeah? But when you're training a flea for a circus, these things truly exist, flea circuses. You, you have to only make it jump a certain height, whatever height the platform is, right? So it might be 30 centimeters. So to train a flea to jump 30 centimeters, you put loads of fleas in a 30 centimeter toolbox and you put a lid on it. And the fleas go and they hit the head and they just jump 30 centimetres because they can't go any higher. And after a couple of hours you can take the lid off and the fleas will only jump 30 centimetres. They'll only jump 30 centimetres, that's all they'll jump. You can tip the box over and you've got rid of the box. There's now nothing constraining them. And guess how high they jump? 30 centimetres. Fascinating. That's the flea's constraining belief. Here's the magic. When the fleas have offspring, how high do you think those offspring jump? 30 fucking centimetres. So we pass our constraining beliefs on. So we pass those things on. My dad's got them. Well, what I eat doesn't make me any weller or better, as long as it's, as long as it's locale. It's not about that, Dad. 
it's, it's about all the things I've spoken about. So be careful of your constraining beliefs because they will define you. My last, I think my last slide, disruption is normal. How we've done business in the past is not how we do business in the future. How we've eaten in the past is not how we're going to eat in the future. But how we ate three generations ago might be. We're going back to the future. Change is fucking inevitable. How it was done yesterday is not how you should do it today. Nothing stays the same and neither should you. This is when the trouble comes, when change happens and you don't. So this new wellness campaign, this new trend for veganism, this new trend for gut, it's not a trend. This is, this is the right thing. All of these things are the right things to do. Eat more diverse foods. Eat a little bit less harm. Don't buy stuff with that fucking dreadful palm oil in it. Don't eat trans fats. Don't load yourself up on sugar. You, you, it's common sense and you all know it, don't you? And yet sometimes we don't want to do it. So, I'm done. Thank you so very, very much.